1. Habakkuk 1. Because uh, if you want to turn to Matthew, and you're going to back a few books. So it's like Matthew, Malachi, Habakkuk. So you've gone to the Psalms, you've gone too far. <laughs> Uh, I just want to say, I, I love teaching and preaching. God's put that on my heart. And I love gathering with Park. So this is like a win-win situation for me right now. I get knock out two birds with one stone. I get to teach and be with you all. And uh, this has been, a, I, I love this kind of season in Park where uh, Sunday evenings uh, you hear other people preach. And I love hearing Dave preach. It's, he's great. <laughs> But, you know, hearing other people preach is just, it's somewhat refreshing. And I think I was talking to Moses, just seeing other people grow, seeing their hearts and seeing them toil in the word and give us that gift. And um, and then I, I, just noticing that a lot of younger people have been preaching, like under 30. And, and that's just good to see. And that's a, that's a gift that you as a church has given us, younger guys, uh, opportunities to preach. I think, I think it was uh, it might have been Mark Devery said, uh, you know, give a pulpit to a cub, and then you'll find you'll have a lion later. And, that, and that's really just, hopefully this is beneficial for you, hearing the word from other people, because we at Park, we value this more than the man preaching. And then also just giving an you know, opportunity for the younger guys to preach. It's just really thank you for that. Um, so we're going to be in Habakkuk 1, and we're going to cover all of Habakkuk 1. And... Uh, to two one, so um, if you want to, if you would stand as we read Habakkuk one. It says, "The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw: O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry to violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? Why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife." And contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. You can be seated. We're going to go in the Lord prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for how kind and gracious you have been to us, Lord. For giving us your word, for giving us your son to die on the cross for our sins, Lord. Thank you, Father, for this time that we get to come together and reflect over your word. Father, I pray that uh, we would not have hard hearts, that you would send your spirit now, Father, to be with me as I preach and to us as we hear your word. Father, that we would be changed, that we would become more mature in Christ, that we become more holy that we may be a light to the world, Father. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So Habakkuk 1, uh, the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, that's the first verse. Um, so oracle, probably want that term oracle, is, it's not a vision, it's not a uh, the word, it's an oracle. Uh, so an oracle that, Habakkuk, that uh, the prophet saw was... Uh, he is getting revelation from God, and he is partaking in the revelation. So this, with this word, it, it should hit us. I mean, I couldn't have asked for a uh, better testimony tonight for this. I mean, she, she works at Wycliffe Ministries, for who's translating the word, and how valuable the word is. And we as a people, right, the more we value God's word, uh, the better it is for us. Because there is no higher value than the word of God. And here we have an, an oracle, right? God is using Habakkuk in this interaction with Habakkuk to reveal himself and a message to Habakkuk. Well, Habakkuk is a little different because most prophets, uh, especially in Habakkuk's time, Nahum and Zephaniah, usually it's a vision or a word comes to the prophet and they are to deliver it to the people. This is not the case. Habakkuk is complaining to God, and God is answering Habakkuk. This, this is an, an oracle. An oracle, really what it means is burden. It's kind of the, the language oracle is a burden, which is 
like I said, the more we value the word, the more it weighs on us, it becomes this burden because basically was Habakkuk, the, the word was revealed to him and it became a burden until he, until he told it, until he wrote it down. I mean, that's just good language. It was a burden. It was a weight on him that he couldn't hold until he was to give it. And, but in reality, it, it, was, it was delivered to Habakkuk for him personally, for his own personal complaint. And yet later we're going to see it is ultimately for his, God's people. And so for us, it's the same. God's word comes, and I hope it's a burden to us. It wells up in us, and it needs to come out somewhere. And a changed life and a message to someone, it's a, it's a burden. It's an oracle. Habakkuk is, um, this is written, there's not an exact date, but it's written near the end of Judah. Um, Babylon's coming. And this is really the, the main conflict here with Habakkuk, is that um, Babylon's coming and it's not good news for Judah. They're going to be destroyed. Um, the, the kingdom has a split. There's the northern kingdom of Israel and then the southern kingdom of Judah. And good kings, bad kings, good kings, bad kings. Uh, right now we think it's a Josiah, probably the end of Josiah, the reign, and, uh, which is a good reign. But they just went through a horrible reign where child sacrifice, worship of other gods, uh, the temple was being uh, worshipped, worshiping other gods is in God's temple. And so uh, there's kind of been a revitalization, but there's still probably among the people, there's mixed worship, hearts are far from God, and their lives are ungodly. And so we see... Habakkuk's complaint in verse 2. Because of this setting, he looks and sees terrible things. Um, he's complaining to God. And this is what it says, verse 2. Oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And you will not hear. Or cry to you violence, and you will not save us. Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked... Surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Habakkuk's complaint is that he sees injustice and violence going unpunished. So he looks around, he sees the people, and he sees terrible things going on. And, and yet the word he describes is violence and injustice. What that exactly was, you know, in the marketplace or the ORNA left, I'm not quite sure what that would have been in Judah, what that exactly looked like. Probably just normal life. As we see just sinners being sinners, violence and injustice is what comes. But today, where is there injustice and violence? That's the question. Where, that's the meaning right here for Habakkuk in his time. But to us, the question still stands, where is there violence and injustice? And where is it in the church? And I think I'd be guilty if I didn't address the obvious. There's racism is alive and well today. Well, while slavery is outlawed, segregation has been outlawed, it's still here. And, I mean, you look on Sunday mornings, with most churches you go to, it's still segregated. It's mainly predominantly white, predominantly black, predominantly Hispanic. And so, I pray, and I hope after reading this, that one day churches will, will reflect the neighborhoods that surround it. That, that's my hope. Is that it's not um, based on how you look. We reach those who, we, who look like us. But who we come across every day. Right? We, we look at them as a person made in the image of God. And that's who we invite to church. That's who we go to with the gospel. Um. And I hope that the world will look at us and see how race should be treated. And we know that race really is not the right word because there is only one race, the human race, made in the image of God. And all this one race is all sinners through Adam. 
and all can be made, made clean through Christ. And it's not really this, it's not really race and ethnicity as just social classes as well. I think as, as uh, sometimes the heart is of a Pharisee. What I don't want to be called racist, but what's the minimum I can do? Uh, love your neighbor. Who, who's my neighbor? What's as little as possible I can do to, to say, okay, I'm not racist and I'm being God. It's like, how close can I get to someone so I can present the gospel, but not too close? But in, in reality, I think like social classes and, oh, I don't know what's happened. Okay, uh, with race and social classes, it, it should be how close can I get? I want to share my life as well as the gospel. And um, a, lot, a lot of times it's comfort. Someone looks like me, so it's comfortable. And I think with the, not just race, but social classes, someone smells bad, right? They look different, they, they, they don't smell like they may have showered recently, and therefore it becomes uncomfortable for me to share my life with them. I, I, would, I might share Jesus, but I would not share a hug. And I, I don't think that's biblical. I think that's unjust. And, um, but since I've been at Park, I think we've made great strides in this area. Uh, I think we're heading in the right direction. But like most things in God's word, we have room to grow. With, with loving, right? I think we're a loving congregation. We can become more loving. I like the canvassing idea for VBS, but maybe not just walk through the neighborhood to canvass for VBS. Maybe walk through the neighborhoods around Park to pray for them, to reach out to them. I love seeing Amazing Grace use our facilities. I mean, what a blessing. I think, I mean, uh, Keith Austin the other day, just, it's good to see uh, other people of different ethnicities using our building. And that we could use it because they are like-minded brothers and sisters who have been saved in Christ. That's just good to see. I love our work with the warming shelter. How much a blessing that's been to us as well as them. And the obvious, I hope our hearts continue to grow for the nations. Brothers and sisters, and then also the lost, who are of different nations, different tribes, different tongues. So what should our response be to seeing injustice and violence in our day? I think it's the same as Habakkuk. What does he do? He says he cries out to help for God. And that is that language. Cry out for help for God to God. Does your heart break? Are you moved? What a blessing it would be to Look out in neighborhoods and see people coming here for church. And does our heart breaks when we don't see it? When we see the lost not here. When you see the lost not coming to Christ. Do your hearts break? No, verses 5 through 11. So that was Habakkuk's complaint. That's our, that was the, uh, your uh, first point. Habakkuk's complaint. The second one is the Lord's reply. That's the second point, the Lord's reply. I know what you're thinking. It's genius. How did you come up with that? No, it's just the headings of the sections. Um, so in response to Habakkuk's complaint, he tells him his response to Judah's sin. In response to Habakkuk's complaint, he tells him his response to Judah's sin. Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded, for I'm doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome, for their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. 
Then they sweep by like the wind and go on, guilty men whose own might is their God. So Habakkuk brought his complaint to God. Violence, injustice, I see. The law is paralyzed. What are you going to do, God? And now you look at the text. What should we expect God's response? What would a response be of a holy, just God to a people who continually rebel and forget? What's our imagination? The holy and just God coming into contact or confronting people who are rebellious, wretched, sinful, ungodly, evil. And these are the words that we, we look at the Old Testament, right? These Israelites... Silly Israelites, how could they? There they, there they go again. All right, and these are the words. How evil could they be? How wretched. And yet many times we fail to use these words to describe ourselves. I like to quote the great theologian Marcus Mumford. Darkness is a harsh term, don't you think? Yet it dominates the things I see. And what does Paul say in First Timothy concerning sinners? I am the foremost. Not that he was the foremost. He says, I am the foremost. I think we should follow Paul's example. Not forgetting how sinful we are. Just because we've been saved. Right? That's the inclination is we know we've been called holy by God. And so we forget how sinful we can be. Think of Romans 7. 14, 15, 19, right? Paul's, that, 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 that his meditation on his sin, Paul, he goes, he says, I'm, a, I'm flesh, sold under sin. I do the very thing I hate. I do not do the good I want, but the evil. He, he does the evil, Paul. And so we see here the Lord's response. The holy and just, what is he going to do? He's going to raise up Babylon. He says, uh, the Chaldeans, that's uh, Babylon. He's going to raise them up. And what is he going to do? He's going to ruin Judah. He's going to absolutely destroy Judah. That's what the holy just will do to these sinful, wicked people. He's going to use the Babylons, who are worse than Judah, to destroy Judah. And he kind of talks about them. He, what, what does he do? He, he, he builds them up, right? And then at the end, it's these people who worshipped and relied on their own military strength. And we're going to see later in the book in the next couple weeks how bad they were, why they were so evil. But, I mean, this is really, you know, this is going to be the rest of Habakkuk's complaint. Babylon's terrible. You're going to use them to destroy us? They worship their own military strength. Like, here they are. Look how strong they are. They're, their horses are like leopards. They fly like eagles. They laugh at kings and they destroy them. They are strong, powerful, and the Lord's saying, I am raising them up. Here they come. I'm going to send them to you. And what is the Lord doing? He's building up their enemies so bad, right? He's saying, this is how strong they are. What are you going to do? Where is your hope and peace? Who are you going to rely on? Your horses are like leopards. You have a fortress? Okay, they're going to pile up earth and they're going to destroy you. Bring your king to them. They're going to laugh at them. What are you going to do? What are you relying on? And so we hear, so after the Lord replies to Habakkuk's complaint, we see Habakkuk's second complaint. That's the point, Habakkuk's second complaint. I'm a genius. How do I come up with this? His complaint begins with a question. We see him coming to terms over what the Lord has answered his complaint with. He, he asks by, and he asks his question, and he gives true statements that he knows about the Lord. He says, based on these facts about God, 
we shall not die. So let's read this. He goes, are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my holy one? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as judgment. You, O rock, have established them for reproof. You are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that had no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet. So he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them, he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is then, is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? Uh, and then two, one, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. So he says, based on these facts of God, we shall not die. He's everlasting. We see that verse. All this is verse 12. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord? And then he calls him Lord. And then lastly, he says, he's holy. So based on what he's doing, so he's everlasting means he does not change. Because God does not change, we will not die. Based on the fact that he's the Lord, that, that covenant name, right? God has that name with his people. I am the Lord. I am your God. You are my people. And then lastly, because God is holy. He is morally Pure, holy means set apart, unique. God is above us. He is, he is unique. And he's also unique morally. He's unique with love. He's unique with his kindness. He has all these things to describe him. He's holy this, holy this, holy this. And this is what Habakkuk goes to. He goes, are you not from everlasting? You haven't, you haven't changed, have you? You're still the Lord. You're still holy. Okay, we're not going to die. It's like Malachi 3, 6. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. (laughs) How how, how sweet is that? God, you don't change. We're good. As long as he doesn't change, we're fine. But Babylon, we see here he's saying is, he's just, they're simply an instrument of God. An instrument of judgment. An expression of God's disapproval of Judah's living. He says, you have ordained them as a judgment. You, O rock, have established them for reproof. He understands what's going on. He understands that Babylon is coming because God has ordained it. He has looked at the sin and says, this is happening. He's, he's on track. And this is where he, he gets confusion is in verse 13. He says, you who are pure eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong... Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? Um, he he's, having, he, he's struggling with this. How is this right? There, wait, I understand we're bad. I understand we need correction. Aren't they, aren't they worse than us? How? He's just, he's, he's, he can't contemplate. God, aren't you wise? Are you holy? How is this right? And here is Habakkuk's fear is kind of coming. He's he's confident that he's going to be saved, but he's also fearful of God's judgment. And that's kind of something maybe for us to look at is even though we can be confident in our salvation, we should have fear and remorse of our sin. Not because we might lose our salvation, but because God is displeased with sin. But here's the thing. If you don't care what so, about someone, you're not going to care if they're displeased with you. I, I care about my wife. If she's displeased with me, it affects me. And if a stranger on the street says he's displeased with me, hmm. Okay, I'm, I might think about that. And here's a suggestion, right? I, my mind goes to uh, David, right? When he's 
with Bathsheba at the end at the end what does it say this displeased the Lord that was enough for David Nathan comes to him this is your sin you've wronged God David isn't his fear isn't he's now cast me away he's he's fearful because he's displeased God who he loves and if you want a suggestion for fighting sin Fall in love with God more. Don't just learn about him, right? We read his words and learn more about him. But why do we want to learn more about him? So we can fall more in love with him. You can learn in that love, but you can't love without, without learning. And then 13 and 17, we keep on going. We see his complaint and his, his main question. Is, is God really going to let a worse nation destroy them? He's not really worried that God's judgment is coming. He's, he knows they deserve it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nation worse than them. So he's kind of like, all right, yeah, if the hurricane came, that's fine. We, we get it. Another, but this nation, they're pretty good. They could wipe us out. That's fine. But Babylon? Which for me sounds weird. I would be more worried to like, all right, we're about to get wiped out. It's like, no, he's more worried about how they're like, oh, no, don't. If we're going to get destroyed, let it be with a, a pretty good nation. I don't get it. Um, his final question, you see that in the, his, this question in the final section? He says, uh, is, in verse 17, is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? That's really what he's worried about. Is Babylon really not going to get punished? Are they really going to get off scotch-free? They're going to take out your people, and they're worse than us, and you're going to do nothing about it. And, and this is kind of the cool part, this whole interaction. The Lord is hearing Habakkuk's complaints. And not only is he hearing them, he's replying to him. Uh, he's, he's openly asking questions to God, and the Lord hears him. And the Lord replies. But and we but we know the, the Lord's reply after the second complaint. We, we don't even have to read it. I mean, we're going we're going to be there the next time I preach, two weeks. But we already know what the Lord's reply is going to be. He, he's graciously answering Habakkuk. But we know Babylon is not alive here today. History and other scripture has already given this point. There there is a there's a pattern. Babylon's not power today, but we also see Psalm 22, 28. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. Job 12, 23. He makes nations great, and he destroys them. He enlarges nations, and he leads them away. There is a pattern all throughout Scripture and history. Babylon is used as a code name for later on. There's, they are... the. Babylon is the powerful, idolatrous nation at the time. Babylon, then Persia, Rome, and then today, you, you can take the guess. God brings justice time and time again. And, and isn't this kind of similar how God uses Satan? He's using his nations to do his bidding. And we see Job, right? He's coming to, right? He's coming to God. And God has them on a leash. You can go here, but you can go no further. But judgment will come upon Satan as well. He uses them for a time, and then judgment. That's kind of refreshing, reading that and going through that in Revelation. And who does the judgment come by? The Lamb who is slain. Ultimate justice and judgment comes from Jesus comes from God. Jesus Christ, who died for sinners, has won and will bring judgment on Satan and all those who side with him. He has brought and bought victory against Satan, sin, and death. Let me repeat that. He has brought and bought victory against Satan, sin, and and death. Let's turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 15. 
We're going to be in verse 50 through 58 as we close. Harry's 1 Corinthians 15, that famous chapter on the resurrection. It says, I tell you this, brothers. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised and perishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must, be, must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of the sin is law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. What was the question that we asked earlier? What might the response be of a holy and just God against a rebellious, sinful, wretched, evil, ungodly people? It might be justice. But it might be mercy. Here, God is offering an open hand to those who are evil. There are only two sides. And if you're an unbeliever, you might be thinking to yourself, I'm not evil. I just don't follow God. But there's only two sides. Those who are with God and those who are against God. So what does God say? You don't think you're evil? He didn't say that's okay. You aren't that bad? He says, you are worse than you think. And you're worse than you can possibly know. He sees your guilt and shame. And Christ took it to the cross. Ye who think of sin but lightly, nor suppose the evil great, here may view its nature rightly, here its guilt may est estimate. Mark the sacrifice appointed. See who bears the awful load. Tis the word, the Lord's anointed, Son of man and Son of God. He took your sin. He took your punishment. It was waiting for us like a tidal wave. And he paid the price. And if you would just trust and believe in him, his arms are open, saying, come. Come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for how kind you have been to us. That you would you hear us and that you speak. That you reveal yourself to us, Lord. Because what greater treasure is that, that we may know you. Let him who boasts, boasts in this, that he knows the Lord. And we thank you, Father, that we may know you through the blood of Christ. And so in his name we pray. Amen.